I was born in New Orleans, and um, I'm one of seven children. And um, now I'm a uh, grandmother of three. I'm a daughter of one. I recently lost my younger daughter four years ago. And I am still happily married, uh, 53 years, as a matter of fact, this year. I did come to San Antonio in 1950 at the age of 10. And uh, as you can see, I'm very happy residing here in San Antonio. May you please explain how the environment in New Orleans was like while growing up? Was it like very ghetto or was it more like, you know? My, um, in growing up, I actually lived in Algiers, which is the West Bank of New Orleans. And um, I really did not know what the word entrepreneur was until I became much older. But I realized after coming to San Antonio and attending college, I realized that my grandparents that I lived with uh, were truly entrepreneurs. My grandfather was an owner of uh, one of the first black uh, cab companies in Algiers. And um, he was also one of the first African Americans that um, worked for the railroad as far as being a mail carrier. When he was a young boy, he also um, carried some of the mail by horseback in rural areas. And as a result of that, he broke his hip one of his hips, and um, he didn't let that stop him. He uh, wore a high heel because in those days they didn't do hip surgery. Mm -hmm. You just you know you just healed, and it was what it was. So he did walk, you know, with a sort of a swing in his in his hip, but he never stopped. My grandmother um, was a cook. She used to cook for the commissioner of New Orleans. And um, that did not last long. She was able to sell uh, pies and cakes when they were building the bridge that goes across from Maine, New Orleans to Algiers. And she saved enough money to open a notion store. So I would say they were considered middle class and Christian people. My grandmother would bake um, the uh, bread for communion and my grandfather was a deacon. Now, my sister is two years older than I am, and uh, Barbara, and she and I stayed with my grandmother because my grandmother had arthritis very bad. And so while my father was in the service um, in Washington, he worked at the Pentagon, and they were, he was in the service for four years. So while he was serving in the military, uh, we were, in Algiers with my grandparents. So I did have a great experience. That's good. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention this. If I ask anything and you're not comfortable with answering, it's all fine. Thank you very much. Um, by any chance, are those businesses still up, the ones that are owned by your relatives? No, the uh, taxi cab company um, actually phased out in the early 70s. And, um, <coughs> and my grandfather died shortly after that, and the business died with him. Uh, the home that we lived in, however, was bought by an architect, and I understood that it was bought by the city of New Orleans, and the home is somewhere in Lafitte, Louisiana, so I haven't had the privilege of seeing my homestead. I still remember the address and everything. Mm -hmm. Did you go to school in New Orleans? Or? Yes, I went to All Saints Elementary Catholic School and I went to McDonough 32. It's McDonough 32 uh, was a public school and like I said, I left there at the age of 10. But do you, how was it there back then? Was it like very? Well, everything was already separate. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, we were not trying to integrate. The African Americans at that time had their own businesses and whatever they didn't have, um, we just sort of made the best of it. Um, I must, I don't know whether it's appropriate, but I must say this, one thing that I personally know about through my mother, <clears throat> my mother 
uh, attended school in Algiers and she had an incident back when she was, she had to be about 14 or 15 years old and uh, she was walking on the sidewalk one day and she had these new shoes on. In those days they only had Sunday shoes, right. Saturday, school shoes and work tennis. And she had these shoes that she had just, her family bought. She was walking on the sidewalk and this white lady was coming toward her and she wanted my mother to step off the sidewalk onto the street, which it was a rainy day, it was muddy. And my mother refused to step off the sidewalk. And as a result of that, my grandfather, his name was Thomas C. Taylor, and the chief of police in Algiers um, asked him, and this is a story that came from my mother, the chief of police warned my grandfather and said, Tom, you need to get Helen out of this town because my wife keeps talking about the fact that your daughter was disrespectful and she didn't step off the sidewalk. And so as a result of that, my mother was sent to, uh, to Oakland, California, and she was able to finish high school there in Oakland. And I think it turned out to be a blessing because she was able to enter spelling bees. She came back to New Orleans as a grown woman, went to the charity hospital, uh, took the licensed practical nursing course, uh, which is a little bit higher than the LVN. It's almost at the level of the ADN program that the community college offers. And so my mother was able to uh, get her nursing uh, certificate at the um, hospital, which I believe uh, was a part of the Katrina flood. Yes. So that basically caused your mom to go to another college just because? It was an integrated high school she attended. So as a result, um, my mother lost her Southern accent. Uh, she had a first class education because she was able to attend um, integrated schools in Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, so she met my dad in Oakland and they married in Oakland, California and then she, you know, returned to New Orleans and received that nursing certificate. So in a way it kind of like had a good impact? Yes, it did. I see. Mm -hmm. um, May you please tell me the story that you want to share? About uh, discrimination? Discrimination. Uh, my experience here in San Antonio, I was very blessed. I graduated from Phyllis, historic Phyllis Wheatley High School. I was the W Club Queen and editor-in-chief of my senior class. I graduated from uh, Phyllis Wheatley in 1958. And my mother and I went to Incarnate Word College, which is now referred to as University of Incarnate Word. And there weren't any scholarships in nursing or in the allied health professions at that time, but there were scholarships at the college proper. And so my mother uh, went there and talked with the, the uh, sisters of the Incarnate Word about considering me uh, for a scholarship. Well, I did get the scholarship and I was able to attend Incarnate Word uh, for two years with a, a nursing major. But when I went to do my practicum in the hospital setting, which was at Santa Rosa Medical Center, I um, was walking down the hallway and I saw this lady she probably doesn't even know whether I'm aware of who she was, but her name was Shirley Conway. And she was very short, and she was manipulating the x-ray equipment at Santa Rosa in radiology. And I looked at the equipment, and I was fascinated by it. So in my sophomore year, I changed my major to the new program that was called Radiologic Technology at Incarnate Word. 
and I was fortunate enough to really blossom in that course, uh, the program. I was able to uh, take those courses at Incarnate Word. So I found myself, because the curriculum was so new for radiography or radiologic technology, the sisters um, made an agreement with the Santa Rosa School of X-Ray to have me take both courses, the hospital-based course and the college uh, curriculum concurrently. So I wound up uh, studying and taking the same academic courses that the hospital-based students were taking as well as the college courses. You know, I, I took the comparative anatomy and chemistry and biology and you know philosophy and theology, all the college courses that the nurses were taking, plus science. So I found myself being a pre-med minor and a major in radiologic technology. So I attended Incarnate Word successfully until I graduated in 1962. And, to, and I found myself being ranked if not top of the class, next to the top position in that major. And what was so surprising, the nun that was affiliated with Incarnate Word that was also a supervisor on the floor in radiology, she never asked me to work at uh, Santa Rosa Medical Center. And um, I guess I just had too much pride to ask her. Um, she um, did invite students that were only in the uh, hospital-based portion of the course. Um, they were all asked to work, not all of them. There were at least three that were asked to work, and she never approached me. So what I did, I tried to search out work elsewhere because I needed a job. Right. <laughs> and. Um, my scholarship did end and when I changed my major, so I knew that I needed to pay for radiologic technology for that, the loan. Um, so what happened was I went to the telephone company, which was across the street from Incarnate Word, Bell Telephone Company, and I applied there, um, went to um, meet the interview and of course they quickly told me that I was overqualified for a position there that I would be taking you know the job away from someone else that was um, that didn't have a college degree and so I left there and I went on to research positions in radiologic technology and uh, I was able to get a call back from Mr. Dunn of General Electric. General Electric used to sell, and they probably do sell, x-ray equipment. And he said he heard about a job in Refugio, Texas, which we call Refugio, Texas. Mm -hmm. And the Sisters of uh, St. Francis were there. And I felt very comfortable being in that environment because of the nuns. And um, they just, I was 21 years old, single, um, no children no children, um, didn't even have a boyfriend, so I was free to go. <laughs> mm. So I went there for one year. The sisters took me under their wing, and at that time I could be multi-skilled. So they were able to teach me. Um, the, um, I did um, um, blood typing, cross-matching, CBCs, urinalysis, uh, they had me operating the ultrasound equipment, diathermy, and of course, I did the main thing that I was hired for, work as a radiologic technologist. And after they uh, informed me that they were leaving, they were closing the hospital, and it was going to be taken over by the county of Refurio, it became Refurio County Hospital. So when they left, I left to come back to San Antonio. So by this time, it was 1963, almost 64. I found a job with, uh, and please tell me when you want me to stop. No, keep going. I found a job with uh, Dr. Sotoday, and he was uh, over in um, Ear, Eye, Nose, and Throat Hospital. And so he was able to hire me to be the radiographer, 
to take uh, x-rays of patients that might fall out of bed while they were, you know, staying overnight after eye surgery. So sometimes I had to take an x-ray of a hip or an arm or a skull or something. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that one day a gentleman came in and again, I'm 22 years old, very naive, fresh out of college. And he began to, he introduced himself. His name was Mr. George Miller. And he says, um, oh, I'm just dropping in to look over the, the lab. He was actually there incognito. Uh, Dr. Sotoday at that time had asked him to come and inspect my work because I had no one else working with me. And uh, I was already doing x-ray and lab because a young lady that was working in the lab portion, she left. And so he asked me could I do um, serve in both positions, which I did. So since I was the chief bottle washer doing everything, I could see why I could be inspected in the lab portion because I had no certification at that time. So someone did come and inspect my, you know, microscopic work uh, for CBCs and, and urinalysis, and I passed that, and I never thought about it. And then Mr. George Miller comes in, and he started asking me all types of questions. As I was doing my work and working with patients, I actually um, took him into the dark room. He followed me into the dark room, and at that time, there was, you know, we manually processed our x-ray film. Mm -hmm. And he was asking me all types of questions and I didn't feel threatened by the questions. I was able to answer them. And he was in awe of the fact that I worked using an old Kellicat x-ray unit, which you would cock the bucky. And it was just old equipment. But I was so happy to have a job. I didn't complain about it. So what happened was after an hour or two, Mr. Miller says, have you ever thought about teaching? And I said, no, the thought has never occurred to me. And he says, well, he says, I'm the program director with uh, Robert B. Green Hospital, and I will go and ask Dr. Zanka, um, would he please consider hiring you? Because in radiologic technology, you have to have a radiologist who's the doctor, over you. You cannot purchase equipment. You cannot do anything on that level. And, and uh, so he was not in the hiring position. So he had to ask Dr. Zanka uh, permission. So I said, I'll try it. Well, a week or so passed and then I got a call back from Mr. Miller. And he says, I'm just so sorry. Um, I told Dr. Zanka about you and um, he informed me that he was not, the, they were not ready to hire a person of color. So he was embarrassed to tell me that. But then I went on with my life. And uh, I went on and worked for the health department after I left Dr. Soda Days. I also uh, worked civil service at Lackland Air Force Base in Wilford Hall. And that's when I got a call, eight years passed, and Mr. Miller called me. And he says, um, I, he says there's an opening for a program director to set up the x-ray program at St. Philip's College. And I said, well, why would you call me? And he said, it's because you had a baccalaureate degree from Incarnate Word, one of the first persons that was a lay person with that degree. He says, do you remember I visited with you at Dr. Soda Days? I said, yes. He says, well, I told the doctor, not only were you qualified, you had a degree, something he didn't have because he was Army, Army trained and he only had certification as a radiologic technologist. So he asked me would I go and apply for the position and I stepped out on faith, came over here and met with Dr. Um, Powers, who was Dr. Peterson when she died, mm -hmm. and uh, she accepted. Excuse me, she accepted me, and I've I worked here for 35.2 years, and um, became a professor 
after working here for three years, and then um, at the end of my retirement, I was deemed Professor Emeritus of Radiography Technology. So I'm just very blessed. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, Miss Gaynor, Miss Professor Gaynor. Mm -hmm. What? So basically, the college you went to taught you all of that about radiology. Well, they gave me the basics. Santa Rosa was where I received my practicum, and so because of the fact that you have to have a a, a practical component, it's not just theory. That when I came to St. Philip's College, there was no equipment, no books, no nothing. And so I wound up doing research. And I found out that uh, Ackerman Road had equipment that Fort Sam had discarded, but it was still operable. It was just outdated. And that was the first equipment that I was able to secure to set up a lab. Because I explained to Dr. Peterson that we could not operate, uh, have a lab a lecture without a lab component. And so I was able to locate on campus uh, in the industrial area. I found a one-story building that was brick and it was just perfect for us to have the classroom on one side and the lab on the other. Mm. Yes, so I also was able to uh, serve with the Registrar of St. Philip's College to go over to Fort Sam, the, they had the Academy of Health Sciences established in the early 80s, and I was one of the first, not only African Americans, but one of the first people in allied health to uh, talk with Fort Sam, the academy portion, about having students come to St. Philip's, acquiring an associate degree, and then staying in the, in the Army. And uh, that did go on through the 80s. And we were uh, actually in competition uh, every other year uh, with Creighton University. Mm -hmm. And so we were successful in, in at least being able to have students come over and you know get the theory that they needed because they had a lab. And we were able to acquire enough money for uh, me to be able to buy a Zonix x-ray unit. And I didn't even realize the money was in the bursar's office for me serving as um, a recruiter of sorts. So that was a blessing for our program. When Miller, when Miller tried to recommend you to the other hospitals mm -hmm. and you got the nod, is, was Miller also an African American or? Mr. George Miller was of a Jewish descent, mm -hmm. and um, he gave me several books that he had because he was planning on retiring. So he says, you know, I'll be happy to give you some books to start with. So what I did, because I was brand new in teaching, um, the college, St. Philip's College, did this for me and others in Allied Health in 1970. They opened up a way for us to go and get our teaching certificates at Texas A&M. So they arranged for us to have a 40-hour week. We had a crash course in how to instruct. Um, so it was a teaching course that we took. We received our teacher certificate. And of course, I, I looked up all the books I could find that dealt with radiologic technology. And Dr. Peterson said, and I have to say Powers Peterson because she was Powers first. Uh, she outlived two husbands. Uh, she was a nurse and she was the person that was the chairperson for Allied Health to include radiography technology. So what I wanted to say about the, um, the portion that, that dealt with um, nursing and allied health. Um, Dr. Uh, Peterson said, if you can be just at least two weeks ahead of the students, you're going to be all right. And just be honest, and if you don't know the answer, just tell them you, you will research it and get back with them. And that was the principle that I used. Mm -hmm. Just simply being, they knew that I was new, 
and I was willing to learn and I told them I would be learning with them but I was just a little bit ahead sometimes I was too prepared <laughs> but I enjoyed it That's good. it was That's a challenge mm -hmm. when you also got the nine how did it affect you and your family like did it affect your family members like your mom or possibly your dad when you weren't able to get that position when um, Dr. George Miller when um, first of all uh, I don't know whether I need to mention the nun's name, but the nun that did not ask me to, um, you know, work at Santa Rosa, like I said, years later she came to me asking me for a job here at St. Philip's College, and I wasn't able to, you know, um, offer her a job, but it wasn't revengeful. But as far as my family, how did they fare? Well, when I went to Refugio, Texas, and I worked for that year, um, land for African Americans was very important. So I was able to put some money aside and I was able to get uh, buy two lots for my mother. My mother did die in 1995 and that was, uh, as it was actually, she was in a nursing home. So what happened there, I was actually um, given an opportunity to write a grant and it was a grant for uh, students that were supposed to come from Central America. There were a few that came from Haiti and from Jamaica. And Georgetown University had this grant, but they didn't have the heavily populated Hispanic community in Washington. Mm -hmm. So they were out searching for a place that would be appropriate for students to come from you know, uh, uh, Central American uh, countries primarily. And uh, Dr. Conrado was the person that actually um, directed the people who were in the position to select a site. And he told them about the fact that at that time, San Antonio uh, had a population of about 45% Hispanic. So as a result of that, uh, we did get the grant. I wrote the grant. I was sent to Manawa, Nicaragua, or Nicaragua, and I was there for one solid week. And I was able to take notes and get the information that was needed for the physics instructor here in San Antonio and those instructors who were going to teach certain courses in radiography technology. Uh, they said I took excellent notes, and so they were able to be really specific about how to train the students to go back to their respective countries and actually be competent uh, as radiographers. Yes. By any chance, um, when you were teaching at St. Philip's College, was mm -hmm. it a four-year back then? Or? No, St. Philip's College is a two-year community college. And um, as a result of me working with and being an active member of the American Society of Radiologic Technologists um, and the American Society, I'm sorry, the Texas Society of Radiologic Technologists. Incidentally, I'm the first African-American president of the Texas Society of Radiologic Technologists. And that occurred back in the 70s. But in speaking of that, with my affiliation with ASRT, which is the American Society of Rad Techs, I was asked to be a site visitor, which opened the door for me to go and inspect other radiography programs around the country, around the United States. And in doing so, I wound up going to Tuskegee University. It was Tuskegee Institute back in the early 80s. And when I went over there in inspecting their um, records, I noticed that when I was looking at their finance records that they did have money designated and it helped students with you know, remedial course, courses in English, math, and reading. And I did ask the question, you know, how did you get this amount of money? And they said, because they were historically black. 
So I was excited to come back to St. Philip's College and I did speak with Dr. Stephen Mitchell. Mm -hmm. um, incidentally, he did pass uh, in 2017, I'm sorry to say. But he was president um, and he was the first um, Anglo president that uh, St. Philip's had. I went to him and I asked him, could we consider uh, looking into the feasibility of having St. Philip's College being designated as um, historically black. And because we were a heavily populated Hispanic community, they saw fit to have that tacked on and I thought it was most appropriate. So the grant was written and by 1991-92 we, we got that designation. So we are the first community college in the nation that is HBCU and Hispanic serving. And so I'm proud to have brought that information and made it possible for us to have this designation. That's awesome. So it, it's just a beautiful thing. And I want you to know prayer. <laughs> I prayed my way through every aspect of my work right. because I could not have done it on my own. Right, amen. Professor Gaynor, did you experience any discrimination while teaching at St. Philip's College? Not really. It, uh, the discrimination that I experienced was overt. It wasn't the in-your-face type of discrimination. Um, more discrimination was in my face when I was in college at Incarnate Word. Um, being in the nursing program at, at the early days of 1959, um, there were, it was very interesting, there were two male nursing students, which was very rare at that time. Mm -hmm. They, together with two uh, female nursing students, asked me to go to lunch one day. And I um, had my lunch, but then I, that day of, of I don't know why I said yes, but I said yes. And I, we attempted to go across the street to Earl Abel's to have lunch. And um, when we got there, they, they said, you know, we can, ex all of you can come in except her. And so they had already had young men walking in with cowboy attire, Western wear, and they were pretty dusty and dirty. So. It was obvious it was my color. So the two ladies went in, but the two young men said, let's go gay now. And so we went back on campus. Of course, I never attended Earl Abel's until I became a graduate from Incarnate Word. And um, Dr. Norris, there's a building here named after Dr. Norris, and his son, Trussie Norris, and I uh, did go back to uh, Earl Abel's and I was dressed in a black dress and he was in a suit. And uh, we were turned away, but Dr. Norris's father did uh, complain to the Restaurant Association and uh, they integrated shortly after that. So it was in the early 60s that Earl Abel's, I must say, was one of the first restaurants that integrated. Wow. Yes, and we've, we've had great you know, results from that. I was going to say, how did your faith play a very important role in all of this? Well, um, a great deal. Um, when I was attending, um, and, and as a single woman, I was attending Incarnate Word, and um, there was a priest that was on the campus that counseled and befriended me. And as a result, I was a Catholic for the period I was, until I became married. When I married my husband, Irvin, um, they were practicing Anglican Catholic Catholicism. So that was Episcopalian. And my parents were practicing Episcopalian at St. Philip's Episcopal Church. And so I just wanted you to know that I was a practicing Episcopalian until 19, um, I think it was 1998, I joined um, St. Paul, historic St. Paul United Methodist Church, and I've been active in the church. But I'm, um, 
very active. I'm a past trustee. I'm a past United Methodist Woman President. I'm on the Pastoral Council, which we call SPPRC, where we are, you know, concerned with the hiring of staff for the church. But I never make any type of a move in my life without praying. And I'm so grateful. I think everything is for a reason. So what physical impact did all of this have in, in you, like emotional, physical, or mental? Like Knowing that um, I'm just convinced that God was in the plan from the beginning. And I think prayer did help because emotionally, I would, you know, there were people that were saying, you should have been fearful to go to Nicaragua you know, right after the revolution, you know. Um, but I wasn't because I prayed. <laughs> and uh, when I started the radiography program without any equipment, without any resources, I prayed and I did forget to mention to you that since there was no x-ray equipment other than the old unit that I did get from the surplus place, um, I found out that San Antonio College had a gener general electric patrician unit on their campus, but they didn't have a radiologic technologist. So they had it in their catalog to offer uh, radiography courses and a program, but they had no certified radiologic technologist. And when I found that out, I was able to contact, uh, contact the uh, college president and the dean of San Antonio College, and I was able to get permission to have that equipment moved over to St. Philip's College. So that turned out to be a blessing. I must tell you, there was some discrimination going on with my pay. When I started St. Philip's, what they did was they gave me what looked like somebody's nine month contract Right. And I was given that contract and it, it was supposed to be spread over 12 months. The counterpart that started physical therapy, and I won't mention her name, mm. um, she was hired in the fall of 2017. I came in July of 2017 and they started her off as, at $10,000, right. which seems like a little money to you now, but um, it wasn't. Um, I did speak with Dr. Murphy, who was the dean of the St. Phillips College at that particular time, and he and I went over to speak to Dr. Moody at San Antonio College. Well, what was happening, they did not have a standard salary schedule, and so they were actually just offering people whatever they thought they should have, oh and so that was discriminatory. But um, in those days, we did not try to sue. We didn't try to fight. Um, I was out of $4,000, and I never got it. And we actually went to um, you know, Dean Moody and um, actually requested that I get those additional funds. And um, he didn't give us approval. And uh, so those things, you know, you just, you never forget, but you can't keep holding it in the back of your mind because it will hold you back psychologically. It would have affected me. So what I've always tried to do is be the best I can be and try to encourage the students to be the best that they can be. And they know that I would try to be supportive of them. And I also encourage them to be a part of the professional organizations that were associated with the field. And so as a result, our students would go to the State Society of Radiologic Technologists conventions here in Texas, and they were always winning either first, second, or third place. So I was very proud of that. And of course, I would not have been able to make it without supportive faculty. My first instructor was Miss Sandy Moore and uh, an Anglo lady, and she was about 4'11", just barely five feet. <laughs> uh, she was a fireball, and together we were able to set the foundation 
uh, for the radiography program with uh, clinical components. So before I retired, we had at least 32 affiliations of hospitals, clinics, in uh, diagnostic imaging centers in and around uh, San Antonio and beyond. And when I say beyond, you know, New Bronzeville, Seguin, uh, Frio City, Uvalde, different places outside of San Antonio we did pursue to have our students gain uh, a great experience in clinical education. Man, I was going to ask, um, I, I think you answered it, but like, that's crazy. So they would basically give you a random like contract and wouldn't, like even if you were to put in more amount of work than another person, they'll basically like pay that person just because of like the way they are or something? Well, being in a professional position, I did not get paid overtime. Mm -hmm. So the basic salary needed to be equal for all, male or female. But like I said, they did not uh, make that right. They did not um, right that wrong until it was the mid-70s, and then they, we came up with a salary schedule which they could publish and say, you know, when you're coming in with this amount of education and experience, this is what you are going to earn. So I was glad that I was a part of that, and I was the, one of the first charter members of the Faculty Senate, which made it possible for us to um, improve on salaries. That's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, there's been a lot of discrimination, like I said, but I try not to delve on it, but uh, <clears throat> I'm happy to have the opportunity to at least um, contribute to history because so often we as African Americans, as a people, our history is lost. And I just felt compelled to come and speak to at least my own um, experiences, because I feel that it's important uh, in order for our future um, generations to have justice. I agree. And so I also <laughs> like how you weren't afraid that you took the step, because like I heard of, I think I heard of this, it said every journey must start with a step of faith, and that's clearly what you did, even though there was a lot of obstacles around you, a lot of discrimination. You weren't afraid to take that step. And now you're where you're at now because you took that step. Like, that's yes. very motivational, very motivational. Thank you. I know when I was uh, in the choir at Incarnate Word, the thought just came to me that it was um, myself and another African-American lady. We went on a bus trip with the choir to San Angelo and Amarillo. Mm -hmm. and remember this was 1960 by this time, 60, 61. And when we were um, traveling to Amarillo um, and San Angelo first, we were not allowed to go into the restaurants with our colleagues. So what they had to do is prepare, buy our lunches and we had to eat in the bus. Mm -hmm. And when it was time for us to spend the night in the Amarillo area, um, we wound up staying in the home of a family who had part ownership. This is what they said, I don't know how true it is, but they said that their family had part ownership in Louisiana Coffee. And the house was a, a nice middle-class upscale home. And as I look back, my home is a little bit larger than the home we were staying in, but nevertheless, we couldn't stay in the motels that our colleagues were staying in, we had to stay in a private home um, because of the discrimination that we faced. Again, based on color. How about the neighborhood you live in now? Does discrimination still occur to this day? Uh, I live in uh, Live Oak, Texas, uh, in a housing development, and again, if there's any discrimination, it's not the in-your-face. It's, it's the overt um, discrimination. And what I tried to do, 
even with being, I'm on the, I'm a charter member of the Seniors of Live Oak. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are individuals that are my age and older that are not used to being in the presence of African Americans. And I must say to you that I have changed the minds of many of them. They say, Gaynell can do this. Or they'll ask me to volunteer for another thing. Just different opportunities. They had me to be chairperson for beautification for our neighborhood. And it's because they accepted me as a person. And I think we just need to show people that you need to judge people like Martin Luther King said, based on your character. And so they just took me as the person I am. They saw that I'm, I speak the same, I am the same on a regular basis, and they just accepted me. And they were able to welcome me into the fold. And now I'm able to participate in activities just like any other member of the community. Professor Gaynor, I think I forgot to mention this. How many children do you have? And Oh, thank you. I, yes, I mentioned. I'll mention it again. Thank you. I uh, have two. I have one daughter now, and um, she's. You know, I'm not going to say what her age is, but yeah. she is a minister and she is a senior accountant with uh, Title Max. Mm -hmm. um, and my daughter, the girls were ten years apart, so I have a daughter that would have been forty this year uh, had she lived. And uh, so she did pass with a debilitating disease, Crohn's. And um, so she left me with two grandsons and my older girl has one son. So my uh, oldest grandson is 19 years old. So I'm not a great grandmother yet. <laughs> and I hope that I won't be for a while so that the boys can, three boys, so that they can pursue their education, higher education. Have they experienced any obstacles like that you probably have or no? Um, just simply in, I would say the 19 year old experienced uh, in elementary school, but um, he, he was, they used the N word, a, a student in the class used the N word on him for the first time when he was like seven or eight years old. And so it still exists. I do believe that discrimination is taught. I believe that it was taught in the home and a child heard that word and used it um, on my grandson. And um, it's just too many examples of children being innocent and not really thinking about separating themselves from other children based on color. So I believe it is taught. My oldest girl, uh, who is in her early 50s now, um, in uh, Waco, because Paul Quinn is the oldest African-American school in Texas, and of course it's since moved to Dallas. And at that time, there were instances of discrimination on the job. Um, such things as when she worked at this, um, it's like a 7-Eleven, and since it's secondhand information, she just simply said that being an African-American female, she was asked to work nights and weekends, whereas her counterpart females, there was just no question that they were gonna work nights by themselves, nor weekends. So it's just things like that that would have you give a pause and say, you know, why would they do this? They really don't value our lives. Um, and so we have got to do everything we can to expose um, discrimination and to have dialogue. We really are in need of having true dialogue about the discrimination that occurs in the United States because we, we've all been brainwashed, right. you know. And I feel like in order for us to learn to truly respect one another and see each other for what we are as, like I said, as a people from the character from the inside out, we, we truly need to have dialogue. I, I would, I'm not complimented by someone saying you're different. 
you're okay, that to me is like an insult. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay? They'll say, you know, we don't like blacks or we don't like African Americans, but you're okay. That's not a compliment to me. Right. Okay? And so I just feel that we do need to do, uh, we, there's a lot of work to be done to improve on the human condition mm -hmm. and to focus on that rather than our color. Mm -hmm. Because we're all, I've done my DNA, we're all mixed. You know, I, I have 74% African American, I'm 24% Western European, I'm even 2% Asian. Mm. I'm not African, I'm not Indian, I'm surprised, you know. So I'm just simply saying, we do need to do, a, and, I, and I wish that the Ku Klux Klan would do a DNA. They'll find that they probably have some African American blood oh, for sure. also. For sure. <laughs> and I think that it would probably put things on an even plane to say, let's look at the heart, okay? Right. Thank you so much. And I love that you brought that up because I also said this, but souls don't have color. Exactly. So I don't souls know. don't have color. Exactly. Like all of us as humans, like we're all the same. We all have the same organs and everything. That's right. So I get why this thing is just like. It's because we have been brainwashed to believe that black is inferior. And I must tell you that when my mother had to leave to go to Oakland, California, and she was not allowed to. Um, participate in beauty contests because she was a beautiful brown woman. Um, when we would take pictures of her, she would turn her head to the side. And we asked, why do you not look into the camera? And she says, because I've been told I was not pretty. And so she was scarred because of that. Um, and we as a people have discriminated against each other. You know, you've heard of the brown bag test. If your skin wasn't fair enough, you weren't able to be in a certain sorority. I'm a Zeta, and we are known for being quite intelligent. <laughs> um, the AKAs had to, had to play down the stigma of you, if you're not fair enough, you know, you can't be an AKA. And I think that's terrible. But like I said, we need to have dialogue in order to lift us up as a people, mm -hmm. not just a black people, but Americans. I'm looking forward to the day when I can be a, referred to as an American and not an African American. Do you recommend that people um, take on the problem the same way you have, like by having faith and in a more, how do I say it? In a more like, uh, I don't know how to put it, but not like in, in a, in an aggressive way, but more like a like patient type, like, uh, uh. That's okay. I think I, I know where you're coming from. I feel that we as disciples in my religion, we save souls one at a time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm a disciple. So what I do when I travel, when I go to groups that are mixed or those that are not mixed, I try to pass on a positive word that has no, dis no color associated with it. So that I notice that you have, we have more in common as human beings than we do as individuals of a certain race, creed, or color. Mm -hmm. And so I try to expound on the commonalities that we possess. And then yes, I do bring in the element of Jesus Christ would not do it this way. Mm -hmm. He accepted all people. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I feel like when we look at people, we should look at the fact that we are all children of God. Amen. We're descendants of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop uh, depressing and suppressing one another and look at the human condition. And that's why it's easy for me to help the homeless or to go and extend my hand to someone of another race without being held back based on what their color is or their orientation, sexual orientation. I think it's sad that 
people are even using sexual orientation as a means to separate the church because God's accepted all people. And we should not be in people's bedrooms thinking about what they do in the bedroom. We really should be thinking about their soul, just right. like you said. Our souls ought to be saved. Mm -hmm. And we ought to lift our souls up. And we are all, we all have God within us. We are the church individually and Acceptable. collectively. Yeah. And this is why I think that it's just so great for us to lift ourselves up and try to take the best. And I tell my students when I was teaching, take the best that each of my, your instructors that you have, take the best from us because we're not perfect, but we do serve a perfect God. Mm -hmm. We're not a perfect people. So take the best that we have to offer. And then I also said to them, a question not asked is knowledge not gained. And so there is no such thing as a stupid question. So I always would leave them to feel like they could ask me any questions. And I said, don't lie to me because you've got to tell me the, the truth because if you don't tell me the truth, the whole truth, I can't defend you. I can't support you. And so I've had open dialogue. My, my door was open. I never turned away a student no matter what their color, race. In fact, I was one of the first ones that hired a transgender student. And there was a problem of what bathroom is the student going to use? It was not a problem for me. I just simply said, go down the hall. There's a single bathroom. Mm -hmm. And that student was allowed to use that bathroom that I used. Each person that would go in there would go in there one at a time and just go down there and use that bathroom, leave the bathroom clean, lock it back, and bring the key back. Mm. You don't have to make it a problem, but we just seem to not use good common sense. Right. And so, like I said, um, you know, there were many other faculty that did not want to hire this student because the student was transgender and actually was a male wearing female clothing. And they were intimidated, but this would, turned out to be an excellent work study student, an excellent student. And then they just looked back at all. Oh, she was able to do that and it was not a problem. No, it was not a problem. Because I do see God in everyone. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel that's what we need to start with that premise. Would God, would Jesus Christ do this? Or if I'm in a situation, would Jesus Christ want this? Or would he not want this? It's just very easy. Right, and, and I, I want to add on that. Like, God doesn't turn his back on none of us. He no, he doesn't. Our back on exactly. Him, and he still has his arms wide open. For exactly. So, would you like to say anything? Um, so, it's nice hearing. I'd be, I'd be walking around here, but I'm just listening. Oh, um, thank you. I would like um I would like to ask you a question and it is um I know you were speaking about that college that didn't give you a job due to the fact that of your skin color yes. basically. Mm -hmm. How you felt at that time? What that like what was the experience like to know that you graduated from college, you had everything you need to have that job, but just because of your color, they didn't give you that job. They didn't hire you. So I wanna know what was the experience like and what you felt at that time. Well, I told you that, number one, I, I needed work um, because, again, in those days, I could only sell Avon. Uh, there weren't very many in stores that you could go and be like a grocery clerk. I actually did domestic work for a month. Um, and I don't even remember the houses that I went to, but they were in the neighborhood where Incarnate Word is. But I needed money for graduation. And so I, I was actually cleaning, um, I went to, I pursued a job cleaning a lady's home. And again, these homes are smaller than my home. I'm in a 14,000 square foot, four bedroom home with a game room and living room. Not bragging, I'm just simply saying that I was so grateful to work for these women and I still, doing domestic work, 
I guess I was so traumatized by the fact that I needed money and I wanted to do an honest job. Mm -hmm. There were no Wendy's, no McDonald's for you to put on a cute outfit and go and work. Those jobs were limited, you understand? Mm -hmm. So what was left for me to do but to sell Avon and to do domestic work? So that's what I did. I cleaned a lady's home for about a month and then she was so pleased with me she told her neighbor. I went across the street and cleaned her home. And they were just so pleased to have this college girl clean their homes. Well, after doing that, I was able to, like you say, um, get what I need for graduation. And I was anxious to pay for my loan for the uh, junior and senior year of college. So naturally, when um, the nun did not offer me the opportunity to work at Santa Rosa in radiography technology, I was devastated and I was desperate. I didn't have time to be angry. And my religious standing is stronger than it was then. And so therefore, I did sulk for a while, but then Mr. Dunn, he was the saving grace for me. Think about yourselves. How would you feel if you had to leave town, you didn't have a car, you took a bus, and you go to a town where you don't know anyone. I didn't know anyone. And so when I worked there in, with the Sisters of St. Francis, they welcomed me. I was the only African American in that department, including you know radiography and lab, et cetera. And I was looking for a place to go to church. So again, remember I was practicing the Episcopalian religion. Mm -hmm. And I asked them point blank, is there an Episcopal church? Not knowing the city was divided. When they gave me the name of the church they knew about, it turned out to be an all-white church. So when I walked in the front door, that's all I saw. I was the only black person in that church in Refugio, Texas. And then as I began, and I had to stay in a woman's home, Mrs. Ryan, I'm, she's dead, I can say her name. I didn't have the privilege of staying in an apartment a studio apartment, any kind of efficiency apartment. I had to stay in a lady's, a single woman's home, share her kitchen and bathroom. Mm -hmm. That was all I could do. And then when I befriended a lady who is in a high position, I can't use her name, in the United Methodist Church, we met each other about three years ago. I'm so excited about that. But she's the one that told me about the layout of the city. There, there was a Mexican Catholic Church, there was a black Catholic Church, there were blacks across the track. The city was just divided. One thing that I thought was quite peculiar when I went to the movies, those of us who were fair enough, mm -hmm. and again, none of them were related to me, but any of those that were fair enough, black, brown, white, and other, they were admitted downstairs on the first floor. Those of us who were visibly black, okay, or brown, we were told to go up into the balcony. And so the Hispanics were on one side and the blacks were on the other. And of course, after the lights were out, you were just mingling. But it was so foolish. It was all based on color. It's very, very foolish. Um, so that was one of the questions. Another thing is that I would like to tell you that today, not only hearing you talk, and telling us about like what you went through and how was it back then, I was able to gain like gain some knowledge out of it. Thank and you. And basically, now I have a different type of view, a vision, like how 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 I had it before, what I thought it was back then. So right now, like I will be able to take back to New York something that I just learned from you and I will be able to spread the word. Thank you so there. much. Um, I, just, uh, I just have a last thing to say. Um, if there's anything that you feel like he didn't ask you or anything you would like to bring up, right now would be the perfect time, time. to do that. So that way we could just end it with Yes, you. that's what I thought. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, do you have any uh, questions that are on your paper that you might wish to ask me first? I was going to ask, uh, what was that question? 
I was gonna ask, what words do you have for us young folks, us young people, to like words of wisdom to help us, like uh, to help us, even though like we might go through obstacles that might come our path to like help us throughout our journey. Having two daughters and also a 19-year-old grandson that um, has been struggling with his mother's death. I was going to say that I've texted him uh, words of encouragement because I draw a lot of knowledge from looking at you know PBS programs, uh, documentaries on African Americans. I've been saturating myself this month with all kinds of history of black people. And I want to say that we are a strong people. Think of all the, ad the adversity that our ancestors, ancestors endured. I know that I've experienced discrimination much more than I've expressed today, but I want you to know that because of the adversity, it's made me a stronger person. And so I want you to take the best that you have from things that you've experienced in each of your lives and take it and impart it to your peers, to your family, and to those that you encounter and hold your head up. Because when I think about the fact that my mother experienced more discrimination than I did and I've survived and my, I've, discriminate, I've, I've experienced more discrimination than my daughters, and theirs is overt. I tell them to don't take things at face value. Always do a little research. Look deeper. Don't be fooled, you know. And so another thing I do is to say pray before, when I would have orientation every semester with my students, before I walk out on that stage, I would pray and ask to ask God to please help me to impart knowledge to my students and for, for me to be able to impart to them the best that I have to offer to them to make their day better, to make their semester better, to make their year better. I don't speak a prayer to the moment. I try to speak a prayer not only to the day, but to the future. Mm -hmm. And so I think that another thing that helped my program to continue with being accredited, every five years there was an accreditation process and the program was exemplary throughout the time that I was associated with it. And now it's back on track and we have a wonderful program director who is in charge of the program and it's all because we strive for excellence. And when you look at accreditation, it comes with standards. Keep your standards high and be the best that you can be. Mm -hmm. And God will take care of the rest. Amen. And thank you so much for the opportunity. No, thank you, Ms. Gaynor. Professor Gaynor, thank you yes. so much. But thank is there you. anything you want to say that I didn't ask? No, I think we've covered all the essential um, points. And as I say, continue to do what you're doing because you have no idea how grateful I was to come today and impart my story to you all so that you can send the, the work out. Because again, I've always strived to try to be the best that I can be, not perfect, but try to be the best that I can be. And I'm hoping that my stories in a small part will help to enhance the lives of the viewer. And it doesn't matter whether you're African American, white, Asian, Indian, a Native American, or other, Hispanic. Please take the best that I have to offer and make it your own. Thank you.